right, we'd like to get started with today's final press conference and our first geoscience grab bag, three talks that are united by the fact that we really liked them. Um, so first we're gonna have Paul Olson from Columbia University. He's gonna be talking about sailing rocks of the past. And then we have Charles Paul from Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. He's gonna take you to the seafloor off of Big Sur. And then continuing to the seafloor, Art Trembanis from the University of Delaware is taking us out to Bikini Atoll. So I'm gonna turn it over to Paul Olson. Good afternoon, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, hiding in plain sight for over 123 years is physical evidence that the tropics froze for brief periods of time 200 million years ago at the beginning of the age of dinosaurs. The evidence consists of a 11 foot long slab of sandstone. A uh, traditional type photograph is shown of that up here and a digital 3D image of it is shown down here. This slab of sandstone bears five large dinosaur footprints, which you can clearly see, made by a type of a close relative of the antecedent to Brontosaurus and its relatives. But most importantly on this slab are these strange grooves that we interpret as a result of what's called a sailing rock linked in ice and pushed along a very shallow lake by wind. Also on this slab is a trackway in this area of a proto-mammal hopping along or bounding along and perhaps escaping into this burrow. Both of these features, the trace of the sailing rock and the proto-mammal trackway were never observed before even though the slab has been on display continuously since 1896. Sailing rocks form uh, most famously in Death Valley and Racetrack Playa when stones get inundated by a thin layer of water. Uh, the water freezes into a thin sheet of ice. The ice locks the rocks in place and then the wind moves the rock and the ice along the surface of the mud making this big drag mark. That's how we interpret this 200 million year long, uh, 200 million year old example. In racetrack playa, many of these rocks get linked in one very large thin sheet of ice. And when the wind blows and changes its direction, all the rocks move in synchrony, as if in a linked dance. That's a distinctive feature of these rocks being linked in ice. But that's not the only uh, part of the story. There's also microbes that inhabit the surface of the mud. Uh, these microbes stabilize the mud surface making a microbial mat, and that also lubricates the surface, making it easier for the rock to slide along the surface. And in the case of this 200 million year old example, the footprint faithfully renders the fingerprint, or footprint, if you will, of this dinosaur. So the microbial mat must have been very, very thin indeed. Now, this area was in the tropics, Connecticut, where these tracks were found and they were in the tropics 200 million years ago in uh, this region here when all the continents were united in the supercontinent of Pangaea. There's no reason to expect there would be ice there except that around 200 million years ago there were these giant volcanic eruptions called the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. The Palisade Sill on the west bank of the Hudson is an example of some of that material. Huge amounts of sulfur were put out by the volcanic eruptions and that sulfur was very reflective in the atmosphere and caused global dimming and cooling. We think that that could have produced enough cooling in the tropics to freeze parts and not all of the tropics. And those same events were also responsible for a mass extinction that occurred uh, early in that volcanic history that wiped out almost all reptile diversity on land at the time. Dinosaurs survived because like modern birds, they're insulated with feathers, or proto-feathers in this case. So here we have a reconstruction of this, oops, pardon me, of this relative of Brontosaurus, bipedal, covered in these filamentous feathers serving as insulation. They were already adapted to being able to survive through cold episodes. Likewise, the proto-mammal, or stem mammal tracks, they were furry, 
and they also burrowed, and they survived as well. So these are, two re these are reasons why these guys survived and so many of the other naked reptiles did not. Uh, that's why the sailing trace itself is important to show freezing temperatures in the tropics. However, it's not totally clear that freezing was responsible. We still have to have the caveat that sailing rocks can also be produced uh, by microbial mats that become so thick and slippery that the rocks can move with just wind and without ice. This is an example from Spain, where the water of this particular lake is extremely shallow, the microbial mats are very thick, uh, and the water doesn't freeze because it's hypersaline, it's full of salt. Uh, in, in a different feature from Racetrack Playa, though, is that when you have several rocks, they move rather randomly with respect to each other because each has a different slight amount of friction uh, compared to the other one. So some moves when the wind blows and the other ones don't move and the wind changes direction. They kind of move randomly around. So that's a big difference. And it gives us a potential way to distinguish between tracks that are produced exclu exclusively uh, by sailing rocks and ice versus sailing rocks without ice. We don't have the evidence of that yet. But if, if that were to be found, that would be conclusive evidence of there being ice, that the rocks are moving in synchrony. As I mentioned, this slab has, was found uh, prior to 1896, 123 years ago. It was on display at Wesleyan University and then transferred to Dinosaur State Park, this, uh, at where it resides today. And hundreds of scientists have looked at these slabs, but it wasn't until 2000, sorry, 2000. 17, that we notice the sailing rock and the small mammal tracks. So these are the basic points that summarize this presentation. The fossilized trace in sandstone is evidence of freezing temperatures in the tropics. It has tracks of a prosauropod dinosaur, that's an early relative of Brontosaurus with skin impressions, and an early mammal relative. Freezing conditions invaded the hot tropics during volcanic winters from sulfur from giant eruptions during this mass extinction event on land wipe wiping out most reptile diversity. Dinosaurs survived because they were insulated by protofeathers, while the stem mammals survived because they were fuzzy, fu fuzzy and furry uh, and burrowed. Definitive evidence would be traces of the sailing rocks moving in synchrony. Uh, it was uncovered prior to 1896, and it's now at Dinosaur State Park. Uh, and even though we've been looking at this, including myself, I must have seen it for 40 times before I realized the importance of those marks, uh, and before my colleague Patrick Getty identified the footprints themselves. Contact information is here. I can provide more contact information if you like uh, after we're all done. And I will mention that we ha I have some props. These are digital uh, printouts of the actual footprints, much reduced in size. This slab is actually 11 feet long, and we can take a look at those. Thank you very much. Questions? Okay, well. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't see a thing. I'm looking like I can see, but I actually can't. I can hear you and I can repeat it. No, I thought they were trying to record it. Oh, yeah. right. Uh, you have this aha moment after seeing it, you said many, many times. Many, many times. Can you amplify on that a little? Uh, what made you on that day say, OMG, this is something more important than I thought? So that's an interesting question, and, and uh, I think that's an important one. All of us as human beings tend not to recognize things that don't fit into our ideas. Uh, we may not, they may not even register as things. Uh, and, and so I looked, at, I looked at this lab many, many times. I, f the first time I saw it, I think, was in the 1970s. Uh, and it didn't register with me. It didn't register with the person who took the photograph in 1915. It didn't register with the people who collected it. It didn't register with anybody. Then in uh, 2017, I've been working on this project in China uh, and identifying uh, the presence of freezing conditions in the, uh, in the Triassic and early Jurassic. And I, I, I knew about sailing rocks, and I thought, well, if you could find evidence of sailing rocks, that would be, um, that would be um, evidence of, uh, of ice. I didn't remember that I'd seen such a thing. And when I went back to the site, after I came up with the idea that that would be something to look for, I looked at that and went, oh, that looks like a sailing rock trace. Now, the small mammal track, that was even weirder, because I was there with a, with a, uh, with a field trip. 
and with uh, uh, another scientist who works on track, Patrick Getty. And he looks down, and you know, we've all seen this. This is after I actually just, a little while after I'd seen this, realized what the sailing trace was. And he says, what is that? I go, that, that looks like a little set of mammal footprints. Footprints have been described from this area since 1836. There are over 20,000 dinosaur and other footprints on the, uh, in the collections at Amherst, Massachusetts, the Beniski Museum. Yale must have another five or 6,000 of them. Uh, nobody has ever seen these kinds of mammal tracks. So both of those things are examples of things which nobody observed because they weren't, in a way, prepared to see them. I wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't believed it. We're actually going to hold questions at the end, if that's all right. Thanks. Oh, sorry about that. It's all right. OK. There you are. I don't know how to advance it. These lights are so intense that you've been looking at them, you can't see anything for a little while. Okay. So you've got three blind speakers up here. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Can you this one? Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Uh, Good. Be careful. Again, I'm Charles Paul, and I'm uh, from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, where I'm a, a marine geologist. Um, uh, earlier this morning, my colleague, Eve Lunston, who's actually sitting in the front row here, uh, presented work that we've been doing off the Big Sur uh, coast of Cali uh, California. Uh, we've been looking at uh, features on the seafloor uh, that are depressions on the seafloor um, that, that are called uh, uh, pockmarks. And, uh, in the process of that, we've discovered that there are other types of micro-depressions um, out there. Now, uh, we're looking at the, the causes of uh, what, what may uh, cause them and how they're acting, how they're manifesting themselves on the seafloor. Now, uh, this area um, was uh, some, somewhat of a research uh, backwater until uh, uh, about three years ago. And that's actually changed fairly dramatically um, because um, the uh, requests have come in for leasing this area to develop offshore wind farms. And as a consequence of that, the, the um, uh, historical lack of any sort of quality multi-beam or, uh, or bathymetric data in this area has, has been greatly filled in. And um, over the last um, uh, two years, NOAA, um, we, with association with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and the USGS have now systematically mapped this area with um, uh, high quality modern surface ship um, uh, bathymetric um, uh, data. And in the process of doing that, uh, they've uh, 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 dis discovered these features uh, or a field of uh, pockmarks that I'll be talking about um, that's uh, very large and happens to underlie most of the northern lease block um, uh, area and some of the southern uh, lease block area in, in, uh, in this region. Now, these pockmarks are illustrated here where there are just a few of them. These are almost perfectly circular, smooth depressions on the seafloor that uh, uh, average something like 170 meters across and five meters um, uh, deep. Um, and the mapping that's been done here has shown that there are something like 5,200 of these features on the seafloor. This makes this North America's uh, largest um, uh, uh, pockmark field. Uh, and the presence of the potential wind farm here makes these of greater interest. 
because pockmarks themselves are, um, are said to have an origin, or the most common explanation for them is that they're places where gases vent onto the seafloor. And uh, it's, uh, it's felt that this gaseous gas that comes up from the bottom excavates the, 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 the bottom. Now, if that is true, that's got implications because it predicts unstable seafloor conditions. Um, and also, venting methane gas supports very specialized biological communities. These are sometimes called chemosynthetic communities. They are there because the methane is there. They're actually living off the energy that comes fr uh, from the methane and synthesizing new organic matter that way. These are specialized biological communities that are usually protected. Now, um, the uh, uh, discovery of, the, of this, the extent of this pockmark field, and now the uh, correlation with this with the new leaf blocks, which are clearly going to be features that are going to attract attention, um, and we, we need to know more about these uh, areas, um, has gotten Embari into the game. And Embari operates um, uh, robotic vehicles. We're particularly proud of the uh, autonomous underwater vehicles that we operate. These are completely free swimming, pre-programmed devices that descend down to the bottom and uh, put, co uh, collect uh, maps of the seafloor, which are an order of magnitude higher resolution than you can collect with a surface um, a, a, a ship. You know, for instance, in this water depth, with the state-of-the-art uh, NOAA surveying tools, they can get bathymetric grids that are on the order of 10 meter resolution. With the AUVs, we get bathymetry that are one meter grid resolutions. Now, we use these uh, uh, tools to, to target sort of certain particular areas, and much of this uh, uh, region or m many of these surveys are where these pock marks um, have um, occur. Now, since 2018, we've collected 20 of these AUV surveys um, uh, down uh, um, in in this um, region, and. Um, We've uh, again continued to map and made the higher resolution maps of the pockmarks. This is one large pockmark. It's remarkable that even at this higher resolution data, these are almost perfectly circular features that are there, smooth um, um, uh, bottom uh, structures, and it sort of has a surprising simplicity to it. But the thing that came to us is a bigger surprise, uh, that using the higher resolution tools, we also see these features that we're calling micro depressions. Um, and uh, there are approximately three times the number of micro depressions as there are at pockmarks. This means that there's something like 15,000 of these features out in the air that we simply didn't know occurred until we started doing these AUV um, uh, 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 surveys of small uh, sections of the seafloor um, uh, in this area. Now, if we zoom in on, on a couple of the micro depressions, they're shown uh, uh, here. Uh, the micro depressions differ from the, the pock marks in, in being smaller, having steeper sides, but also having tails that go off in a direction that probably suggests there's a, there's a role for currents in their, um, in their uh, uh, formation. Um, now, the other thing that these uh, 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 autonomous underwater vehicles um, uh, do is they carry another type of sonar that penetrates down into the ground and gives us a view, a slice of the ground, if you will, that highlights the layers um, in the bottom. And I'm showing you here um, images of the subsurface. Uh, these are 10 meter scale bars, so we're looking down into the bottom, something like 50 meters into the subsurface. And, uh, when we see the um, uh, micro depressions, we, which are uh, very small things at the surface, we don't see any tail going down underneath it. That's something you might expect at those gaseous methane coming up. Um, in the case of the pock marks, you can see right off the bat that they're much bigger features um, here. And the pock marks, we see reflectors that extend down into the ground, something like 50 meters into the bottom. From what we know about the rates that sediments accumulate in, in this area that, that comes from C14 dating, this would indicate that the, that the uh, strata that were deposited at this level were deposited about 400,000 uh, years ago, which suggests that these features have persisted through time. But you can also notice that they seem to migrate slightly upwards with time. And the other relevant aspect of this is there is a, uh, a uniform reflectorless layer at the, the top that seems to overlie the last sort of discrete event 
that occurs in, in these features. And I point this out because it's probably been on the order of 50,000 years since anything of significance has changed the nature of the strata um, in, in, in this um, area. Now, um, we you have historically used our AUVs to, to generate, if you will, roadmaps for going back for ROV diving. Um, in the last year, we've had 30 ROV dives down in this um, region using two different uh, um, Ambari ROVs. Uh, and of course, ROVs go down to the bottom. They're first and foremost eyes to see the sea floor. Um, you can bring back video to the surface, but there are also ways to sample. You can sample by taking push cores of the bottom, but we also have a coring system on the front of one of our ROVs that's able to penetrate um, 1.7 meters um, in, into the bottom to get samples of the material. This is particularly appropriate for looking at these micro depressions because they're tiny features that'd be really hard to find any other way. So we're able to sample explicitly uh, within these uh, uh, micro depressions. Now, uh, we've uh, spent uh, 150 hours looking at the seafloor uh, in this area, hunting for signs of anomalies inside the pockmarks and outside the pockmarks. And, you know, honestly, uh, we can't tell the difference visually between the background sites um, and the pockmarks them themselves. They, there's sort of no indication that they're there. In fact, we have a hard time even determining visually they were in the pockmarks, the slopes are too, uh, too gentle to directly perceive. We know we're in there only because of the navigation of the uh, data from the vehicle um, and the changes in pressure with depth. The thing which um, we do find is the micro depressions are, have uh, a curious aspect that they frequently, in fact, usually have some, some objects in, the, in their interior. Now, these objects uh, include, in some cases, uh, 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 rocks. These rocks are completely out of place here. Uh, we believe that they've been uh, floated off from the shoreline on kelp. Uh, so that they've been floated out to see where the kelp then uh, decomposes, drops them to the seafloor. There was some discussion about whether it's the placement of this object in the seafloor which ends up with the erosion of these sites, and specifically which is giving rise to the possible origin of the micro depressions uh, uh, themselves. But the other thing that we see is, and many, many of them have substantial accumulations of marine debris. Oh, let's just be honest, it's trash It's on the seafloor. These are whole plastic bags in some place. In some cases, many of these um, uh, depressions have plastic bags in the subsurface, and they do have more fauna in them. These are just animals, and anemones in particular, that are attached, at, at, attached to the, the trash. The other uh, objects in them, some of these micro depressions have fishing gear. So in some regards, these depressions seem to be the receptacles which are capturing marine debris on the seafloor uh, you know, and concentrating them in these uh, sites. Now, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, stated origin of the pockmarks, again, goes back to the possibility that methane is coming out onto the seafloor. And one of the, the, uh, uh, the goals of the various cruises we've had out to this area is to look for geochemical indicators. The most significant way we get it is to use our vibro coring system to, to put put cores into the ground that are more than a meter and a half long, and then we extract the water from these cores. We look at the chemical signatures of those, of those waters. And in this case, we see the waters that are inside the pockmarks, outside the pockmarks, and in the micro depressions are absolutely indistinguishable based upon the chemical composition. They almost certainly would vary if there was a flux of fluid and gas coming up from the seafloor. We see no visual evidence of upflow. Um, also, uh, we see no uh, de deposits on the seafloor that would have precipitated there if we had fluids coming out of the seafloor. So we and we see no uh, specialized biological communities or chemosynthetic communities in there that would be there if methane was coming out of the seafloor at these sites. Now, just in summary here, a unifying thing, both the pockmarks and the micro depressions uh, that we found uh, show no evidence uh, that there's methane venting going on. So the common model 
for pockmark formations apparently is not working in this site. Uh, you could say that it may have been formed in the past, but that's a very other unsatisfying uh, answer. Um, and th there are no specialized biological communities in the, area, in the area. This actually has implications for the characterization associated with the uh, decisions that society is going to have to make about whether the wind farms will be developed in this area. So, um, you know, the, in terms of the microdepressions, I find it interesting that we're finding here uh, uh, evidence that there were 15,000 or so previously unseen depressions on the seafloor in this area. It's an indication of what you can do if you start looking into things with systems that are higher resolution and what you can do with seafloor robotic uh, uh, tools. Um, the, the micro depressions themselves uh, uh, are, are not incipient pockmarks. They get a different shape. Uh, they appear to be recently eroded features. Um, and one of the interesting things is they seem to be providing a habitat, part for fish, uh, but they're certainly collecting debris that's on the seafloor. So disproportionate amount of debris is accumulating in them. Um, and I, I think that uh, there's some uh, significance that we now know that there's no significant modification to the pockmarks on a time framework, which is approximately 50,000 years. And these features have been out there been, and persisted in approximately the same site for uh, 40,000, 400,000 years or so. Now, uh, again, um, we have contact uh, here, and we would like to talk to you more. And uh, Eve, who doesn't want these uh, lights in her face, is also here to talk if you like. Thank you. blinding up here. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, the LEDs, we can't turn them down. Sure. Here we are. There we go. Oh. Oh, okay. Turn this down a little bit. Okay, go ahead and get yours on. Your okay, great. Thank there. you. I'm reminded of the philosopher Berra, Yogi Berra, who said you can see a lot by looking in today's this morning's talks. Uh, the headlines uh, from July 25th, 1946, such as this one from the Chicago Daily Tribune. Headlines around the world rang with the news of the atomic bomb testing in the Bikini Atoll, where the fifth nuclear bomb and the first underwater nuclear test had just been conducted. News accounts tallied a box score of damaged and sunken ships. I'll be very delicate with this one where the sixth largest fleet in the world had been assembled. This was a very unique fleet as it was assembled to be sitting ducks in a nuclear barrel. Now today, for the first time in 73 years, we can revisit the site and help complete the story, the untold story of the conditions on the seabed with the first comprehensive view of the simulated nuclear battlefield and revealing for the first time the remains of the still visible Baker Crater. In doing so, we connect to a moment at the dawn of the nuclear age and at the early stages of the Cold War. Our new findings provide unique insights into previously un unknown conditions at Bikini and allow us to reflect on the lasting consequences from these and other tests in terms of the impacts both to the environment and to the toll on ships and the fallout and displaced and impacted peoples in and around the, the testing sites. 73 years ago, the otherwise tranquil and idyllic lagoon of Bikini was ground zero for the first underwater nuclear test, a bomb named Helen of Bikini. And Bikini was chosen because of its idyllic and remote uh, remoteness in the large, easily accessible lagoon. At the time, Bob Hope quipped, as soon as the war ended, we found the one spot on Earth that had been untouched by war and blew it to hell. Here, more than 240 ships were assembled, including both German and Japanese ships. As the bomb blast went off in a microsecond, a flash of blinding light, even brighter than these lights here, en engulfed the scene. Temperatures soared into several million degrees. The water was vaporized and collapsed in a bubble on in onto itself and then re-radiated back out. Within seconds, 
more than 2 million tons of water, sand, and pulverized coral shot into the air in a column more than 900 feet wide as the mushroom cloud developed, sending that material a mile high. Hot winds raced across the surface following a series of tsunami-like waves that lifted and twisted ships. Of course, what goes up must come down, and so all that 2 million tons of sediment water and polarized coral came crashing uh, back down on whatever happened to be too close uh, to it. And thus ended the tests of Operation Crossroads, where the fourth and fifth nuclear weapons were tested. And yet, in many ways, the experiment did not end with the Baker blast. It merely initiated a longer period, a largely undocumented experiment that we see that has continued up to today. Uh, our team, I represent a team, a multidisciplinary, multinational team, collection of oceanographers, geologists, marine archaeologists, engineers, and dive specialists. We were assembled with a task and goal of conducting a geophysical, or rather geoacoustic survey of the uh, target areas here in what's the Operation Crossroads kill zone. This was by far the most remote uh, operation that my group had ever conducted. It required months of careful planning, many weeks of advanced shipment of our equipment, and it took us fully six and a half days to get there, including a 60-hour arduous and very bumpy rough crossing from Majuro uh, to Bikini. It was a, a reminder of the very reason why Bikini uh, and these other islands were selected. In the span of an eight-day period, uh, that we were on site uh, with our goal of, of mapping. We, we mapped uh, this area about one and a half times the size of uh, Central Park and a one meter per pixel uh, digital elevation model, of which I have a, uh, a physical 3D print of it here, a little easier to carry, uh, with a mass for more than 20 million data sounding points. When we look at a cross section through the, through the Baker Crater, and this was one of our first uh, surprise discoveries, was that the Baker Crater still remained. Still remained, it was quite visible. Although it was not visible to National Park Service and Navy teams that went in the late 80s and early 90s, we needed advanced sonar to be able to see this large feature, which clearly stands out. And, and to me, it seems as if Captain Marvel herself has punched the, punched the planet and put a dent into it. The colors here represent uh, depth, and here you can see the anomaly of the Baker Crater relative to the surrounding uh, seabed, about 800 meters in diameter, about 10 meters of relief. And I remember quite vividly as we were passing lawn mowing back and forth, and one line we took us right through the center, right through the center of the crater. And for a moment, I had the realization as I looked up that we were in the middle of that, of what had been the mushroom cloud. And so my team and I took a moment of silence and, and observed the somberness of, of that awesome and inspiring sight. When we take a closer look, a deeper analytical look at our data, and now look not just at the bathymetry but at the slope, we can see this sort of rose petal structure. There are coherent bed forms. This was even more shocking than finding that the Baker Crater was still there. We expect to see some remnants of it. What really shocked us was to find that there were bed forms. There were subtle features. Large, these aren't small ripples. These are large uh, bed forms. Coherent structures that clearly radiate out from the center of that, uh, of that blast spot. So the first time ever we're seeing these bomb-derived bed forms, as if, as if a, you know, somebody had dropped a very large pebble onto the, onto the seabed. And we can see these also in, in cross-section here next to the USS Pilotfish, a, a below-class uh, submarine that was held in suspension in the middle of the water column. It was the closest submarine and one of the closest ships to the Baker blast, designed to take several hundred pounds per square inch of force before crushing. Pressure sensors on the pilot fish recorded peak pressures of over 5,200 pounds per square inch as this pressure waves and rushed through the sub, ripping through every bulkhead, just to, to give us a sense of the power. And yet, as powerful as we might think that the crossroads tests were, they pale in comparison to the later hydrogen uh, fusion bomb. So having completed our work in crossroads, we took a day and went to the far west of Bikini Atoll, where you can see in satellite images now the clear outlines, cutouts, of, of an anomalous crater. These were from the 1954 testing that returned to Bikini, a series of castle tests that were hydrogen fusion bombs that started with this, the Castle Bravo, a 15 megaton bomb, still the largest weapon the U.S. has ever tested. And the sheer size of this, you could fit Monaco inside here. 
What was anomalous to us was that it had this sort of oblong outline, and it wasn't until we started mapping that it became very clear to us why that was the case, because it's not just one crater, but it's the composite of two craters, one from the Castle Bravo test, the other from Castle Romeo, and four or five additional tests were conducted in this area in 54. What is even more incredible is a realization that there were once three small islands right in through here. The bomb was placed on, on land and completely vaporized those islands, leaving behind only, only the hole. So between 1946 and 1958, 22 bombs were tested at Bikini, the, the, the most of, of any island in, in the Marshall Islands. The crossroads tests left behind an amazing collection of shipwrecks, perhaps the most amazing collection of, of shipwrecks uh, in, in the world. And now we have, for the first time, a detailed map of that domain. We can see now the forest and all the individual trees of the sea, sea floor. An important new discovery was that of these bomb-derived bed forms in the Baker, a still visible Baker crater. And we also examined and documented the structure and nature of the Castle Bravo and Castle Romeo blast craters, at least in a preliminary sense. Taken together, this work, we hope, opens our eyes to new insights into the bomb impacts and serves as a reminder to the heavy and still ongoing toll that this testing has had on the environment and on the mankind affected directly and indirectly by this testing. And um, I'd be happy to um, put you in contact uh, with other members uh, of my team, Dr. Jim uh, Delgado, Dr. Mike Brennan, um, marine archaeologist. Dr. Delgado led the National Park Service team in the late 80s, early 90s that did the initial uh, work in there and, and, and published, wrote the, the book on that. And my team was comprised of a uh, former PhD student and an undergraduate who accompanied me for the mapping program. Thank you. All right, thank you, Art. And we're going to open the, yeah, we'll start with Jennifer. Hi, um, Jennifer Lehman, Popular Mechanics. Um, Art, this is for uh, this question. Arthur, this question is for you. Um, could you talk a little bit about some of the impacts that these um, explosions uh, would have had on the ecosystems and talk about what we can tell um, from what we see now? Yeah, so um, it, it, it's a bit different. We don't have too much baseline uh, to compare from uh, to, to today. Um, really, this, this mapping provides some of the most comprehensive baseline. What, what we can look at is, is certainly some of the changes to um, to, to, the, um, to, to the ships. We see some changes around those. Um, in many ways, Bikini has become an, am an amazing example of, uh, of a, a marine protected area uh, in the intervening years. You know, fishing was restricted. Access has been severely restricted. Uh, and so what we saw um, in, in, in some of our dives and some of our e explorations around was the corals seemed to be very uh, healthy. There were very uh, healthy fish uh, communities, including up to top predators. I remember our first dive after we deployed some instruments at the top. We had to place a tide gauge at the top of the Saratoga because there was no tide gauge stations there. And as we were hanging, doing our safety stop, we were being circled by a, a very interested uh, tiger shark. Um, and so, um, so the, you know, in, in, in terms of that, there were there were some very you know positive signs. It was very difficult both there and on land. You know, you're just surrounded by this very idyllic uh, island setting. Um, and it's really not till you kind of s step back and, and take it in from the sonar surveys that you see this larger scale uh, impact. I mean, the, 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 the bomb craters are still quite uh, visible there. Uh, one, of the other, one of the other things that, that is very visible, and you, you, we would smell it as we were mapping, is uh, that many of the wrecks, these, these were not prepared as artificial reefs. When artificial reefs are prepared, you strip down ships, you remove fuel, you remove electrical wiring and things like this. These were prepped as, as as a war game scenario. So they're all filled with different levels of fuel uh, and of, of munitions. Uh, there are torpedoes on the deck of the Saratoga. And as we were mapping, I could, I could know without looking up when we were near the Saratoga because we could smell that the bunker fuel was so heavy and still streaking uh, out. The Nagato, which was the uh, Japanese flagship that planned, that Yamamoto used to plan the attack on Pearl Harbor, had a, a streak of, of fuel coming out from it uh, for many miles. And so one of, the, one of the, the things that is continuing is sort of low, low levels and potentially increasing levels of that as these ships are degrading. And we know they're more degraded now than they were in the late 80s. Um, and we've seen in, in, in World War I era ships, you know, century-year-old ships, where they've reached sort of a tipping point and starting to break up. And what we may be starting to see is the onset of that for the World War II era, era ships. I mean, these are unique in that they were 
they were bomb battered, uh, but they're not unique in, in having uh, the, some of those constituents. Uh, more questions from the audience? Thanks, Jonathan Amos, um, BBC. Um, I mean, what was your expectation? Did, did you think that sediment would have filled the craters? I mean, what, what, what did you, yeah, Arthur, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what was, what was your expectation? You, you say the, the craters are still there. Were, were you thinking that they might not have been, that sediment would have completely filled them in? So um, my, my background is in uh, coastal sedimentology and scour processes and bed forms. So I'm, I'm, I'm used to operating in, in settings where there's a lot of dynamics to sediment getting chipped around and ripples forming and, and, and filling and scour around objects and things like that. And so, um, you know, this was my first time working in a, in a, in a Central Pacific Atoll. Um, I think I went into it thinking that it would be just a big quiet bowl that would be smooth on, on the bottom. It's, it's quite... It's quite a, 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 a varied surface with these large coral heads. Some that were so large that at the time they, they dynamited them to clear, to make clearings to, to bring ships in before they set off nukes. So things that I think would just astound our, our sensibilities, environmental sensibilities today, but, but said, certainly made perfect sort of logistical sense at the time. Um, so uh, yeah, my expectation, my, my thought was that um, in the intervening 73 years that through winds, waves, maybe storm events that, that um, that sediment would get moved around and sort of uh, filled in. Um, I, I, I expected to see some remnants of the Baker crater, um, but it's still quite pronounced. And then uh, further than that, the fact that we could see these subtle bed forms told me that we really had it frozen a moment in time. Um, you know, we've moved on, but, but, but that, that seabed is, is reflecting those, those waning periods, you know, as, as these waves and this sediment was moving around. So for those smaller, subtler bed forms, to still be uh, preserved spoke to me of the of one the, the very low sediment uh, input you know the new sediment production that happens, which makes sense. It takes millions of years to build up these corals and things in here, and two the generally quiet benign conditions uh, in in the lagoon. Um, and and also just in in terms of radiation, is that I mean mm -hmm. is uh, what are you what are you detecting there now? Well, we, we were we were all required for for um, health and safety reasons to, to wear dosimeters throughout the expedition. Um, we actually had a couple of sets of those, and those were all uh, taken off and analyzed. Uh, the report I got back said that I would have a, a greater exposure walking around Manhattan. Um, so, um, and that included we did some shore excursions. We went uh, to the beach in on Bikini Island as well. As well, uh, I believe the hottest area we saw, which which was almost not hard, hard to perceive was uh, a one little bunker, part bunker near the Castle Bravo uh, crater uh, that was one of the, the testing uh, things there. There are still issues in, in the water. Uh, conditions you know, have, have been abated from, from mixing and, and, and rinsing of water. Uh, we did actually have some fish from the lagoon. It was quite tasty. Uh, but um, we, um, we, we were told there is an active DOE uh, site on Bikini Island. The, the issue that prevents the Bikinians from coming back is that there are still high levels of radiation in the soil that bioaccumulate in the coconuts, and then the coconut crabs eat the coconuts, and so it's not, it's not able, they would not be able to subsist on, on the, what would be their, the, you know, a, a natural food source, either from coconuts or coconut crabs. But, but for us, the conditions were, were, were quite fine. And more questions from the audience. Do we have any questions on the chat? No questions on the chat? Well, our, our panelists will be here for a few more minutes if you think of some questions and want to come up and talk to them. Otherwise, thank you to the panelists.